Probably one of my most favorite aspects of producing wild harvest is that I get to teach you some tips and some techniques for gathering from the wild safely and enjoyably. The reality is though, there are risks associated and do not underestimate them. Everything from eating a poisonous plant to touching a plant that you shouldn't. The best way you can feel safe out here and gather responsibly is to seek out a local expert. Start with your books, go online, but find a local expert, someone who's passionate about wild edible plants and have them teach you the safe and responsible ways to enjoy the wild harvest. You know, in our quest to enjoy the wild harvest, you know, Paul and I get to enjoy some of the most beautiful, stunning scenery. And sometimes, yeah, we do go a little bit remote, but I keep pitching this idea that you don't have to. You don't have to travel far. You don't have to book a plane ticket to experience the wild harvest. In fact, you can do it in your own backyard. So case in point, this time around, Paul and I just left his house. We've walked five minutes. You don't have to be a worldwide adventurer or an explorer. You don't even have to know how to set up a tent to enjoy the wild harvest. Hang on, Paul. This is when patience is the name of the game. Now, walking on this trail, I kept seeing wild edible plants. I was like, oh, that one, uh, maybe not that one. Oh, what about that? Uh, there's not very many of those. And the second part of the equation is that often what gets people into very dangerous survival situations is when we fall prey to our own lust for adventure, which is, I wonder what's up around the next corner. Well, I let myself do that, and I just thought, all right, let's just keep going. Maybe I'll go all the way down to the river. Let's, let's just see. I get down here and I think I found you something that you can really enjoy for the wild harvest. Now oh, here, you take this beast. Okay, that's yours. And I will lead the way. <sighs> Chipertia canadensis, Canada buffalo berry. So it's nicknamed soap berry. It has sap in it. Now that chemical, when you take the juice from this berry and you whisk it up, it makes like uh, egg white, just like egg white. When you look underneath, this Canada buffalo berry has these little beige brown spots and little silvery spots on the undersides of the leaves and on the twigs. For edible quality, it's not the best. You know what? Have a taste. <laughs> That's not very uh, palatable. Oh, one of the words used to describe this berry is unpleasant. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, accurate. Mm -hmm. What I'd like you to do is actually get as many as you can. I want to be able to play with this a bit. I think when we get to the kitchen, I'll help you out. I'll get it all frothy and pass it off to you. Yeah, I'm, I'm so intrigued by that. I'm going to go look for some other plants and leave this harvest to you. Enjoy yeah. the harvest. Enjoy the river. Beautiful. This is what I'm looking for. This stand of Douglas fir that's five minute walk 
from Chef Paul's house is actually the most eastern stand of this tree, uh, if not on the planet, in Canada, for sure. So the reason why I want to highlight this tree for Chef Paul is because I know he's in love with them. He walks these trails all the time. He passes these trees. It's the first thing he told me when I knew that we, I was going to be joining him in wild harvesting close to his house was, you've got to see the Douglas fir trees. And his, his eyes sparkled and lit up. First thing I want from this beautiful Douglas fir is some sprigs. I want the needles. Now, truth be told, it would be better if I was here in the spring when the ends of the sprigs of needles are light colored green and you can, I mean, they're just, they're just delicious. You can make shortbread with them. Uh, they're wonderful, but I'm late in the season. And then I look up and yeah, take a look up there. That's not happening. So I was actually a little disappointed. I thought, well, I can't, I, there's no young ones. I, I can't. And then I look down and I, I notice, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's one laying on the ground. And then I looked, oh, oh there's another. So here we go. So that is one way to harvest from a plant that is, uh, in this case, getting very rare. The unfortunate side of that story is that through fires and through logging, the word is decimation. The inland Douglas fir has been pretty much decimated in Alberta. So there are only a few beautiful ones left. And so the harvesting I want to do to make it special for Paul is just whatever is littered around on the forest floor here and this will do. This right here is also what I want. A little bit of forest debris is all it looks like, but what it really is are the old cones from the Douglas fir. Now the seeds are gone, so this is forest floor duff at this point. Saw this when I walked by. Some bark, for whatever reason, has been knocked off. So I think what I'll do is finish my gathering here, spend a little time with this beautiful Beautiful Douglas fir tree. This is pretty amazing. Being five minutes from my house, for how many times I've been here, I've not actually stopped to, to take in the moment, to sit back and, and breathe and take it all in. Well, this beauty at some point saw a fire. Now, whether or not that's a lightning strike or it was a ground fire coming up, I think that's probably the case because the top of it is all healthy. It's been living here a long time with this injury. Powerful, powerful trees. Well, my friend, what I want to get from you is some of this hard pitch that's come out. This actually is formed a long time ago when the tree was trying to protect itself, trying to heal itself from such a nasty scar. Taking a little bit right now is not going to bother it so much. You ready for the reveal? I am, let's do this. All right, well, door number one is a simple and obvious one, and you already know it's coming. There is your soap berry, Canada buffalo berry. You know how you often say to me, oh, Les, I brought you the story of the ocean to the plate. I brought you the story of the forest to the plate, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm kind of stepping on your toes a little, stealing a little bit of your thunder and saying, I wanted to bring you the story of the Douglas fir for you to play with and plate with. And there we go. <laughs> Those are the cones from the Douglas fir. I gathered up also for smoking or for plating, that is Douglas fir bark. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Look at this Isn't that stuff. that beautiful? One. That is Douglas fir pitch. So we can ingest this if you come up with a way to melt it down or work with it. I leave that to you. These needles were all laying around the tree on the ground. They've been soaking overnight. My suggestion is utilize the needles any which way you see fit. 
but don't forget the water because now it's water that's been infused with the flavoring from these needles. Mm -hmm. So you have that to play with and a little surprise, even Kevin doesn't know this, I found one tiny sprig that had freshly fallen off the tree. So there's your buffalo berry, your Douglas fir tree. My job's not done. I'm going to go down by the Bow River and find us some tea. All right, so that's my job. Yours is to get to know your new bounty. Enjoy. Well, I'm blown away. I've always been in love with the trees by my house. The trees themselves are majestic, and I've never considered using resin as a flavoring agent before. These cones, what an interesting concept. I love the idea of using them as a, a smoke component. Okay, time to taste this buffalo berry one more time. That flavor is so intense. I have to figure out a way to um, bookend the flavor profile of that. The middle flavor is looked after. Now I have to establish that first taste and that aftertaste. The first thing I need to do is I have to take these morel mushrooms, which we dehydrated when they were in season, and I have to refresh them. Now, the big thing with refreshing mushrooms, you don't hit them with really hot water. Hit them with a cooler water. So I'm thinking a risotto for this first course. Knowing that there's flavor in the resin, which is completely delicious and plus I already have some of the flavor of the needles as they've been reconstituting in this jar that Les gave me. Should make a really easy job of getting some flavor of the Douglas fir tree into something very familiar. Yeah, what the heck. <laughs> the rehydration liquid from the Douglas fir needles already on its own has a lot of aromatic quality. That is uh, a win. Start cold, light simmer, and just let it steep like a tea. I'm using the charcoal to build a smoker. Right, how we doing? Check this out. These are zucchini from the garden. And can you smell that? Oh yeah, I can. Are you, you're smoking them. Oh, I, know. I didn't, exp I, that, yeah, blowing my mind. I was expecting to see liquid and all sorts of things down here. That's amazing. Wow. Like even taking That's these away from it, they smell. Ah, oh, yeah. I, I, oh, I, I can't even describe it. I've never even seen this before, like done this way. That's great. So, you gotta check this out. Are we coming here? Yep, go to that pot. Okay. Pay attention to what it does to your taste buds. Okay. And where you taste it on your taste buds. Do I cool it down? If you want. If not, it doesn't matter. I, it just ha it's its own thing. It's a flavor. It's definitely, uh, I can, I've got the flavor. I just can't describe it. Yeah. Mint, what is mint, that? Minty-ish? Grapefruity-ish? There's an earthy tone to it uh, on so my palate. And I know this is a cliche, but it tastes like the forest. It does taste like the forest. Uh, in a good way. And okay. smells like the forest. All right, uh, I will get out of your hair and let you do what you do, but I'm going to go froth up the berries. Sounds good. You can use a 
back of this ladle just to squish that in. This is gonna be fun. Yeah. Okay, Chef Paul. I've been whisking for years. Advice on whisking? I will make it so it's easier. I'll show you a technique. Okay, yes, please. I hold it between my thumb and my mm -hmm. index finger. Mm -hmm. And I let my wrist do it. Let the, uh, the length of the whisk work for you. That way your movements in the hand are minimal. If you're doing something like egg whites, you do the same sort of thing, sort of a figure eight move. Figure eight move, okay. And then here's the, the big technique. Start uh, incorporating air. So a circular motion. Get some air into it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Ha ha, whisking lessons from a master. I might actually let you survive next time I take you out in the woods. I think I've got this at a beautiful, beautiful state. Two things. I don't know if it's gonna stay like this or if it will turn back into liquid. Uh, I have this much again I can still make up, but I thought, why don't we do the test? Yeah. Okay, right. we've got a spoon right here for yeah. you. Yeah, let's do a taste test. Now yeah, you first. We'll see the reaction. Don't say anything. My cheeks go like this. <laughs> wow. Yeah, you're what alive. Do, what do you think? What do you think? Uh, you think? Adding the air to it softened it. Okay. So to me, it's about half as strong, half as potent as it was before. That's one of the coolest things I've ever done to wild food. That's just great. That is crazy. All right. Time for the rice to go in the pot. Now, time to measure out the Douglas fir stock. Right now, I'm doing two parts of stock to the amount of rice that I measured off. And what I'm doing is I'm part cooking the rice so I can make a restaurant style finished risotto. I'm setting up the smoker for a second time. It's time to capitalize on the Douglas fir bark. I've got some duck confit. I think by smoking this, the, the duck will become the perfect flavor carrier for the bark of the Douglas fir. time to, to finish this risotto. Now this isn't risotto in the traditional sense of cooking method. This is the way we do it at a restaurant so we can cook your food to order, customize it with the same end result and flavor profile as if you took the time to do the classic method. The one big difference that separates the two methods is in this recipe, I've par cooked the rice, which means that long time cooking process has already been looked after. Douglas fir stock and some rice. Now this is my chance before I serve it to fine tune the flavor profile. The fir resin holds a lot of flavor. I'm hoping that it melts and then becomes part of the sauce. The lesson that I've learned working with needles is the finer you can cut them, the better off you are. More of the, the flavor that's hidden within. I'm adding a, a touch of nasturtium. Wow. This is a dish that is designed to extract the flavor 
of the Douglas fir resin and the, ah. the needles, the fresh ones that you gave me. Yes. Um, I cut them up very fine. That one little yeah, sprig? Yeah. Oh, I'm so happy that got used. Yeah. Mm. There it is. Like you always tell me to do. See where it hits you on the palate of your tongue. And when it hits you, that's a lesson I've learned from you. It's not about just where it hits, but when it hits. The first bite, I actually do get a bit of the morels. And the last part of the bite, I actually feel like I get the risotto. But the middle section is all Douglas fir. So the Bow River runs alongside your restaurant. So I've got a rock from the Bow River. On top of the rock, I have all of the ingredients that we harvested from the forest by your house. Nice. And surround now in the middle is your grandmother's teapot. Yeah, I recognize right? that. Uh -huh. So this is your grandmother's teapot, which I am suggesting this represents you and your connection to family and the restaurant. And so surrounding you and your restaurant, we've got um, sweet clover, uh, red osier dogwood, bellflower, common tansy, burdock. So these are plants that many of them, while being edible, are growing just on the other side of your fence. But I thought, what should be right in the middle? Something right in the middle of this yard here. So I went and picked some of your mint. And I've got it with some, uh, some of your own honey. And I thought, you know what? Let's have an iced tea. Brilliant. Mint and honey. I'm just getting hungry. This is a great win. You're not done. I'm excited. I'm excited to see what you do from here on in for the next meal. Douglas fir risotto. Yeah. Now we're talking. One of the critical things when it comes to a good duck confit has to do with the skin. The skin has to be nice and crispy. I first started it in the pan, skin side down, and now I have it in the oven, cooking on the skin side, just to crisp it up. I'll flip it over in a minute. Let me check that confit. Oh, that's beautiful. The skin is nice and crispy. That's perfect. some duck confit fat to help make this dressing. The important thing is I don't lose the essence of that smoke in this dish. That's what I'm talking about. So that's it. You know, whether it's a bush camp or a survival shelter, high-tech tent or your cabin in the woods, your home kitchen, or fine dining in a restaurant, either way, harvesting from the wild brings you variety. I'll bet you right now, wherever you live, if you were to go outside, there are hundreds of delectable treats just waiting to be discovered but it also gives you connection, connecting to nature. Do you know why we have photographs and paintings of rivers and streams and mountains and forests on our walls? Because we seek to connect with nature. I can't think of a better way than through the wild harvest. Cheers.
Sinestra, okay. star of the so, show, amazing yeah, guy, yeah, awesome yeah. everything. So this, I had a, like in every episode, <laughs> you're you're saying that I have a reflective. What? Your mic's on.